Who am I? I'm a pen tester. I'm a destroyer of things, IoT. Um, yeah. I'm part of a team of over 80 of us now who spend a huge amount of our fun time taking IoT apart and then trying to disclose it to manufacturers and trying to get manufacturers to improve things and then banging my head against a wall when nothing changes. Uh, you've probably seen lots of our research in the public domain. You might have seen our work on um, cars, smart fridges, smart TVs. You might have even seen my friend Kayla. Do you remember her? Swearing doll. She's great fun. Which I was super happy, actually, because she was cited by um, one of the lawmakers in the state of California as one of the reasons that, um, I guess, really got them going with State Bill 327. I, I was so happy to see work that we'd done was used as the catalyst for regulation. It makes me so utterly happy. But I want to talk about stalking your kids first. Does that sound safe, doesn't it? I wore this on the tube today. Got lots of really weird looks. Who knows what it is? Anyone? Show of hands? We may ask. It's a kid's GPS watch. Good on you. So this is a particular brand that I recorded for the Beeb. Um, we had a lot of fun doing this. This is the MySafes, and it's called the MySafes Kid Watcher, which I thought was quite good fun and rather cool. And um, we, uh, we found some vulnerabilities in it. And we did what we always do, which is go through responsible disclosure, where we tell the manufacturer about it privately. And then what always happens is they ignore us. And so then we say, right, OK, how's about we get a journalist involved, use their clout and the media exposure, right, like a journalist calls, then they still get absolutely nothing back which is a bit worrying, because this is a really cool little app. I've actually tracked myself, but the bit that really freaks me out the most, hopefully it's all working. There you go. It's in there. So I'm going to use the vulnerability in the API, and I am going to call the watch in what's called monitor mode. Now, hopefully that will answer, because I've got service. Yes, I have got service. Come on, you know you're going to do it. Good. You see, it just says busy there. It didn't actually ring. Wait for the screen to go black in a moment. So unless you were looking at the watch, you wouldn't know. That watch is now bugging me. And there's a vulnerability in the API, which means that anyone can connect that watch and bug any of the kids. And I find that really, really creepy. But the worst bit was, there was another vulnerability in the API, an insecure direct object reference. The idea of the watch is you give it to the child so you know where they are. Who, when they had young kids, ever had one wander off? I certainly did. And boy, did I panic when that happened. Great. So this seems like a fantastic idea to um, resolve that problem. Except that there is a complete lack of authorization to the user account on the API, which means that anyone can access all of that. And when I say insecure direct object reference, what do I mean? I mean changing a one to a two. There's no verification that you're the person who should be requesting that kid's data. Just have a little think here about all the devices that you've got in your organization that collect GPS data and use an API. Do you use things for tracking, stuff, things, containers, anything, vehicles, that telematics unit in your car? Anyone check that API is safe? Crazy, right? So you can recover in real time the, the GPS positions of this particular brand of about 20,000 children. Although we started looking at some other brands of late as well. I'm not going to name them all because so far, we can't find one that we can't do this to. Um, we're currently tracking data that indicates in excess of 3 million children. And the problem we've got is we can't get hold of all the vendors to tell them about it. So I can't tell you who it is, because that wouldn't be ethical, would it? This is really scary, right? The number of times we hit an API up for an IoT product and find a complete lack of authorization. And you know what really pisses me off is it doesn't have to be that bad. I love this example. It's the best ever toy I've ever had. BB-8, Star Wars toy. I bring him along occasionally. He's actually in my kettle, which is in my office. Long story. Vendor called Sphero. Licensed from Disney. Awesome. And I found a minor bug with their firmware update process. It was done plain text. So if you were really lucky, you'd be able to intercept it and push rogue firmware. But the timing was, you know, it's all about timing, being in the right place at the right time. I tweeted a DM to the vendor, Sphero on Boxing Day a couple of years ago. They acknowledged it within about 25 minutes, and they fixed it within a week. That's cool. What an awesome vendor. Why can't everyone be like this? Acknowledge and fix. 
Surely, it's not that hard. Or maybe it does. <laughs> I want to say about my smart locks because some of you might remember the stuff I did on the tap lock a little while ago. And you know what? Every smart lock we touch seems to turn to rat shit. Tap lock, great, had a minor production flaw that uh, a YouTuber discovered that if, uh, when it was first assembled, if the back wasn't turned on properly during manufacturing, a pin didn't engage and you could unscrew it using something like a, a suction mount. We tried that, turned out it was a one-off production manufacturing issue. However, we saw that they come quoted on Bluetooth, they use AES 128-bit encryption. That's military grade. Must be fine. How did they implement it? Well, when we started looking at the way you unlock the lock, mobile app, works over Bluetooth, tap the lock, it unlocks. How did they do that? We started looking at the way that it was generated. Did you see key one and key two? Interesting. Yeah, some hex digits there. What did we discover about them? Interesting. First of all, it wasn't, um, there was no timestamp, so you could replay, so you could listen to the Bluetooth, uh, the BLE um, interaction and replay it. But the worst bit is when we started looking at how that key, unlock key was generated, it was seeded from the Bluetooth Mac address. The one thing this device broadcasts all the time. What? It's like hanging your key outside your front door on a piece of string. The one piece of data we needed. So all you had to do was you uppercase half of it and lowercase the other half, and you could do this. You could unlock any tap lock in less than two seconds. We've actually got it faster now. There you go, it's unlocked. Bingo. Okay, that's good. So I went through a process of disclosure, and we said, guys, you've got a problem. And they responded saying, which, which really shocks me, we've got a reply. They said, thanks for your note, we're aware of these notes. I said, what? So you know about this, and you've continued to ship. Really? That's a bit brave. <laughs> I'm thinking, this is a security product that's keeping your stuff safe. So yeah, we're thinking, OK, that's not so bad, because you'd have to go and find one. And then we started looking at the API. And we discovered that the API leaked the geographic address of the locks. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So um, then we told them to take the API down. And they did. And you can't buy them anymore. So that's why this one cost me over 150 quid, because I had to ship it in from France. You can't buy the tap lock anymore. What a shame. Why did it have to come to that? Why couldn't they have been through a secure development process where someone said, don't use the Bluetooth MAC address as the key? and don't allow your API to leak data. Surely the most basic of thought processes would have said, don't do that. This one was um, funded on the Canadian equivalent of Dragon's Den. It's called Shark Tank. You can go and find the episode, download it, and you can see them pitch the product. What a shame. Other crazy smart locks. This one I love because it's fantastic. Every smart lock we have a look at is brilliant. This is the Ervatron padlock. Follow the lock picking lawyer on Twitter. He's brilliant. It's held together with three torque screws. So the lock picking lawyer said, um, Guys, why has your lock got an external screw that I can unlock? And they responded by saying, the lock's invincible to anyone who doesn't have a screwdriver. <laughs> what? Are they mad? Um, but the other fun things you can do, smart locks have often got motors in them. And if the cabling's exposed, you can often just open it up, apply a little voltage, and the motor will drive and the lock will unlock. So uh, we thought we'd have a look at this. This is not the Noak lock. This is the Noak lock, right? So a lot of brand issues there, OK? This is not the Noak lock. This is the Noak lock, where they've clearly ripped. I don't know how this works. Anyway, so we took it apart, and we found this little um, plug on the bottom. So we pulled the plug out and found a screw. OK, that's not a good start, isn't it? Found the screw, pulled it out, got the cables, and then connected them up to battery, and the lock opened. Really? Isn't this supposed to be a security product that's supposed to keep us safe? This is nuts. Oh, and by the way, we're just about to publish that the API has got the same floor as well. So you can, uh, through a complete lack of authorization, you can unlock anyone's lock as well. Crazy. I'm going to go on. I want to have some fun now. I'm not really going to talk about home products. I'm going to talk about my favorite bit of research that I think we've ever done. And does anyone know what that is? Yes. Yes. And what do we know about the Bitfi? It's unhackable. Never, ever say a product is unhackable. Because you will have a whole ton of security researchers <laughs> on your ass. Absolutely good call. They offered a bounty as well, didn't they? They did. Should we go? Yeah. Well, it started off at 100,000. And then they upped it to a quarter of a million. So let, let me tell you about it. I'll tell you the story, because it's, um, 
It's hard to listen to without laughing hysterically. <laughs> the BitFi, the next generation hardware wallet. So you're supposed to store your cryptocurrency passphrases and seeds on here. The world's first unhackable storage for cryptocurrency and digital assets, quote John McAfee, who's a very interesting character. <laughs> you should go and, go and search John McAfee in bath salts if you ever want to see something really weird going on. So anyway, so we started looking at this. This is before we got hold of one. Your private keys are never stored anywhere in your brain. It's a brain wallet, which is an interesting concept. But not only did they claim it was unhackable, they also, as you pointed out, put up a bounty. I thought, cool, we like bug bounties. That's a really cool way of crowdsourcing um, security researchers and giving them a way to talk to you. So we'll put them into a wallet. We think, great, if you, get, if you hack it and get the passphrase and seeds, you can have the 100,000 bucks. Awesome. That can't be quite a bit of fun, actually. So, then we discovered it wasn't quite what you'd usually perceive a bug bounty program as being, because they claim that their security is absolute. I think the game's afoot, don't you? This is sounding like a really interesting challenge. We are unhackable, and here's 100,000 US. Get in. But what they've made is a fatal mistake. That Bitfire is unhackable. They equated it to one very specific attack. The challenge was... We'll load a BitFi with a small amount of cryptocurrency and we'll send it to you. And if you can recover those, you can have the bounty. And they equated that with being unhackable, which was a very, very big mistake. So we put a group together. Now, we first got hold of one, and this is great. So it's a hardware wallet with a firmware encrypted CPU. I don't know about you, I've been in embedded systems for 24 years and I've never heard of a firmware encrypted CPU before. But I'm thinking, okay, they've got some pretty hardcore stuff out there. A USB charging cable and also a very strong source of entropy, a six-sided die. Literally, they gave you a die in the box so you could generate some entropy. I'm like, surely we could use a pseudo-random number generator that's located on the hardware, maybe? I don't know. Anyway, let's move on. So we put together a team. Now, that, some of you might have come across my colleague, Andrew Tierney, also known as Cyber Gibbons. That's what happens when you give them bananas after midnight. But I would say, this wasn't just our work. There were five of us on the team, but there are over 20 awesome security researchers from around the world who came together to do this work. We were heavily involved in it, but it wasn't all our work. And for a bit of fun with the press, we gave ourselves an acronym. And then we found journalists starting to quote this acronym in press statements. I'm like, what was going on? This is really good fun. We're really enjoying ourselves. So then people started interacting with McAfee from the group. There's no memory to hack, no data. There's nothing but the phrase in your head. I'm thinking, okay, if it's only in your head, why do you need the hardware wallet? Okay, fine, whatever. So got hold of one. I thought, that's interesting. Looks really quite familiar there. I thought, okay. So, Mr. McAfee said, there is no RAM on the device. I'm thinking, okay, that's, that's interesting. I've never really worked with anything in embedded systems that has no memory of any shape or form. Um, and then he went further, and in response to somebody else, he said, it can't be hacked. There's no software on the device, no memory. So what does it do if there's no software on memory? Wow, I really want to know about this like, $140 system. This sounds really, really interesting. It's going to challenge the hell out of us. So we opened it up and saw this thing, which is a 4C, 8 gigabyte RAM chip. <laughs> I went, okay. So, so John McAfee said there was no RAM. So we sent him this picture and he replied by saying, when I say there's no memory, what I meant, there's no storage of any piece of information regarding, obviously there's RAM memory, but the RAM's devoid of meaningful data. I think this is sounding really good fun. What else can we do? So we started analyzing hardware. We bought a few, got some turned up. And um, once we got it open, this is it here actually, we realized that actually it was a very small tablet. That's the bit fine. Very small tablet. Once we got the back off, we realized it was a tablet phone. It was a MediaTek MC6580. And the one problem with that particular chipset is it doesn't have any trusted execution environment or secure storage, which doesn't sound like the best hardware chipset to base a cryptocurrency hardware wallet, does it? Not great. Off the shelf in volume, probably 20 to $25 tops. Um, so we went back to him and said, John, you've chosen to develop this based upon a phone. And he replied, it's absolutely not a cell phone. 
anything resembling a cell phone. All cell phones are hackable, which I thought was a brave thing to say. Um, so then we went back to him and said, OK, well, there's the back of it. Looks a bit phone-like to me. There's the SIM card slot. <laughs> Sounds a bit phone-like. Um, then we went to their own website and said, well, you even called the image of the Bit5 smartphone. Um, and finally, in your own instructions, it says the phone will return back to the previous interface. Like, wow, OK, definitely not a phone. And then Bit5 disowned John McAfee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wow, OK, so you've brought on someone to um, shill up your cryptocurrency wallet, and now you've had to disown him because he's not behaving. That was fun. So let's see what we found, shall we? There was $100,000 at stake in the um, bug bounty. During the process of John McAfee snorting even more bath salts, um, it was up to a quarter of a million dollars. This is a really interesting challenge. So the group got together and thought, like, let's have a go. Let's see what we can find. First thing. Because they chose to use the MT6580, the screen digitizer, so the way that you put your um, passphrase and seed in on the keyboard, is sent to the CPU using I2C, which is not encrypted. So all you've got to do is look for that ribbon cable, put two probes on, and you've got screen positions in real time. If you want to have some fun, you want to um, weaponize this, bear in mind we're talking about cryptocurrency seeds, so a lot of cash. Get hold of it, supply chain a check, halve the size of the battery, put in there a small 3G module um, with a couple of uh, logic probes onto that ribbon cable, and you can get out people's seeds in real time. We're talking bucks here, a lot of money. The other major problem, MT6580 has got an open, unsecured bootloader. Oops. So you could read out the file system, and there it is. Oops. Not a good place to start, is it? Bad place. And then, for a bit of fun, uh, we rooted it. And we got a little present for Mr. McAfee, so on the team, got Doom running on it. <laughs> I don't know. It was a bit of fun. What, what, I have to confess something as well, OK? So if we're going to go back to the beginning there, can you see there's a bunch of wires on it connected up to a Raspberry Pi? Can you see those wires? They don't do anything. <laughs> we just did that to put uh, BitFi off the scent so we didn't disclose the way we really did it. <laughs> Loads of people on Twitter going, wow, what did you do? They're held on with blue tack, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so did that. That was good fun. Um, next thing we did is we wanted to look to see if we could intercept the transactions as they're being authorized over Wi-Fi. So this device will connect the internet to your home router, and we want to see if we could actually intercept those <coughs> transactions over the air. And Bitfire made a very bold statement saying, well, it's, that's why it won't work. You can't do it. If you tamper with anything, if you mess around with anything, the transaction will be voided. We welcome you to try. So we did. We intercepted the transaction, we modified it, and we sent them somewhere else over the air. Oopsie. Don't claim something if you haven't checked, surely. But the bounty for a quarter of a million dollars was essentially what we call a cold boot attack. So what we'd need to do is they'd load the cryptocurrency onto the um, the BitFi, power it down, send it to us. It would take several days, even in air transit, to get to us. So we needed to be able to recover the crypto seeds from a powered down device. Now, surely they wiped memory, so it would be impossible for us to do that in a cold boot situation. However, one of the team, who was only 16 at the time of doing this, successfully recovered it. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole video, but what I'm going to do is go right to the end. Yeah. Do you like the cheese? There you go. And after a period of time, we successfully got, yeah, so let's pause that in the right place. Cold boots, quarter of a million dollars. Now, so we put that to BitFi. Do you think they paid us the quarter of a million dollars? No, instead they threatened us. Which I thought was a bit of a shame, actually. That was a bit odd, really quite odd. And um, so we said, Mr. McAfee, John, you know, we, we, we've done it. We've done everything you asked for the quarter of a million dollar bounty. To be honest, we weren't going to take it. We were going to give it to charity anyway. We'd already decided as a group. Um, I think there was a bit of an autocorrect issue going on. We're not quite sure what gas ramen is all about, but whatever. No one came close to taking the coins from the wallet, which started to make things quite interesting, because then John said, OK, all right, if you're prepared, if you believe you can do this, you can have a go at my own wallet, which has got $20 million worth of cryptocurrency on it. So, out to see John McAfee in his ranch in the USA. I'm thinking, okay, that sounds like a brave thing to do. Then John tweeted this. 
I thought, okay, you're just taking delivery of some um, M4 machine guns, okay. I think we might just stay in the UK if that's okay with you. Um, there is a nice end to this. Well, we didn't get the quarter million bucks, which frankly we didn't really want anyway. At the Black Hat Awards in Las Vegas, um, the Pony Awards are given to best research, lamest spender response, and I'm very proud to say that the, the research uh, that was done by the group uh, was given a pony. So John McAfee's Bitfi was given the Pony Award for the lamest vendor response, and I'm very, very proud of that. <laughs> Quarter of a million bucks. So what are, what are our learnings, okay? What have we learned? Number one, don't claim a product is unhackable. It's going to end really, really badly. And amazingly, in the time since we've done the Bitfi, we've seen two more products have advertised themselves as unhackable. What do you think I'm about to disclose? <laughs> Excellent. Really important points. When you're developing, please get your base hardware right. That's the one thing you cannot fix in the field. There are many things you can fix with a firmware update, not your hardware. Make sure you've got one with a trust execution environment, good entropy source of random numbers to CD crypto, somewhere a secure enclave you can keep things safely, lockable bootloaders without code read app protection bypasses. Make sure you can access the tool chain so you can build and check it properly yourself. If you don't, you haven't got a clue. And get your firmware audited. Get it reviewed. Choose software devs who really understand security. If you're looking at APIs or mobile apps, make sure they're following OWASP. Really good advice there. So ask for evidence of a secure software development lifecycle. Prove that whoever's building your stuff for you has a clue about security. And please, ask for help early on. Getting someone in to give you some advice about how to build IoT securely on day one it's going to save you months of pain later on. All too often, IoT products, they send them out to be pen tested or security reviewed just before they launch. And what do you find? Pen tester finds a problem. What do you do? Do you miss Black Friday or do you carry on shipping? What do you do? So get advice early. It's a much cheaper way of doing it. Get a bug bounty program. It's a really good idea. You might as well. It's not going to cost you very much to do. And if someone does find something serious, they've got a way to contact you quickly. But please do not substitute that as your only source of checking. There is no substitute for a secure development lifecycle. There's no substitute for getting a very thorough pen test. And there's no substitute for getting a really thorough hardware security review. Because otherwise, you might end up dragged through the press. And no one wants that to happen. There is some good news. Kayla, my swearing doll, she got banned, mostly through consumer group pressure, which is really interesting. There's been steps in the right direction in the US. This is still going through, and unfortunately, you're currently missing Bo Woods from Iron the Cavalry, who's talking about IoT regulation, which is where I'm off to next. California State Bill 327, really cool, fantastic. It's not very specific, but I think it's a great start. In the UK, we've got the um, uh, Department for Culture, Media and Sport, which is fantastic, secure by design, the code of practice is great. And I was super happy, I did a piece on ITV News a few nights ago, and we managed to get Margot James, the minister responsible, to come on and say that regulation is inevitable. They've published the code of practice, now's your time to get it right before regulation comes and you end up with product being pulled because it doesn't comply. The regulation, the code of practice is great. Have a read of it. There'll be copies around upstairs. Go and grab a copy, have a read, and make sure you're following it. I think we're going to end up seeing some regulation in time. I think there's going to be some legislation. There's doubtless going to be some litigation. There's two class actions lawsuits in the US that have settled, both involving excessive data collection from adult sex toys. Great. But in the meantime, my blog is full of advice top 10 things to do, top 10 things to look for in hardware, top 10 things to look for in your API you're going to do stuff with. That's my Twitter. That's LinkedIn. I hope you find it useful. Thank you.